So this is Mary. Um, she's about 23 years old in this picture, and it's turn of the century, turn of the last century, Chicago. And she's been married now for a couple of years. She's just given birth to her first son. And you may not recognize her outfit and the latest fashions of 1903, but you can tell from the way that she's dressed that things are going very well for her. That she's leading a reasonably prosperous life and that the future looks very bright. But three years after this photograph is taken, um, at Mary dies of chronic liver disease, something that really shouldn't kill somebody at the age of 26. The girl standing with the hair bow there is Edith. And she's there with her younger sister, Frances, and it's 1918, and they're in Poland. Their father um, went to the United States. He was supposed to bring them, but a world war erupted and intervened. And their mother is working incredibly hard with not a huge amount of success to support this family. In fact, Edith sleeps every night on two wooden chairs pushed together. And the only advantage to that is that she doesn't have bed bugs. And one of her earliest memories is of investigating the crater left behind by a bomb that exploded in her village. But in 1920, her father finally has the chance to send for them. And they make this ocean crossing, and Edith and her family move to Chicago, and she learns English, and she bobs her hair. And here she is at her elementary school graduation, Garfield Elementary. But this is the end of the line for her education, because her father says, there's no money. You have to go out and get a job. And the Great Depression is not a great time to look for your first job as a person with only an elementary school education. But Edith doesn't really let this stop her. And she knocks on doors, and she marches on in to a Chinese restaurant and convinces them to hire her as the hostess. And that's her first job. So why am I telling you these stories? These are incredibly bittersweet stories. And they would be at any point in history. So Mary, full of promise, full of hope, dying of a disease that is absolutely treatable. And of course, this happens every minute of every day all around the world due to geography or poverty, lack of access to medical care, lack of knowledge. And Edith, another reasonably common story of incredible opportunity of immigration, of struggle to assimilate, of education cut short again by wealth or geography or gender, and of the difficulty of finding a good job, which we, of course, now hear every single day on the news. But to me, these are actually stories of incredible opportunity. Mary, that son that she gave birth to right before she died, was my grandfather. And so her fleeting opportunity is one of the pivotal, pivotal opportunities of my very existence. And Edith was my grandmother. And she worked incredibly hard all her life, but she made opportunities for herself. And she pursued them, and she hung on with all her life. And she ended up completely and utterly financially self-sufficient to the ripe old age of 97. And she made sure that every single one of her children and grandchildren got the education she didn't have. And so 82 years after she graduated from Garfield Elementary, I, her oldest granddaughter, walked across the stage with a PhD in molecular biology. There are a lot of cliches about opportunity, right? Opportunity knocks, opportunity is golden, and opportunity is once, of a, once in a lifetime. And they always make it sound like serendipity. Right? Like something that you're born to, something that falls into your lap, something that you either get or you don't, you either have or you miss. And sometimes that's absolutely true. I was born into opportunities that I had nothing to do with simply because of the things that my grandmother and my great-grandmother did. But opportunity isn't only that simple. Right? You make opportunities. You pursue them with all your might. And then you have to make something of them. So when I was 13, I read a newspaper article about the coolest thing I'd ever heard of. It was a genetically modified tomato in development by a company in California. And I thought this was fantastic. And I was going to be a geneticist, and I was going to feed the world. And by the time I was 22, I had a degree in biochemistry. 
And I started off on a series of jobs around the world doing agricultural genetics and development. And I landed myself at a research center, Rice Research Station in West Africa in the Ivory Coast. And that's why I met Jeanette. Now, Jeanette and I could not possibly have had a more different upbringing. I grew up in suburban Chicago. I had advanced degrees. Jeanette grew up in a village in the Ivory Coast. She dropped out of school at the age of 17. She was a single mom. But she didn't let this stop her. And one thing you know growing up in a, an agricultural village is how to farm. And so Jeanette got herself a job in the fields at the Rice Research Station near her village. And she was smart, and she was literate, and she got recognized, and she got promoted from the field to the greenhouse, and from the greenhouse to the brand new molecular biology lab. And that's where I met her. And now, contrary to whatever it is you might be imagining, it was actually Jeanette who spent the majority of her time teaching me. Because she had not just how to do things like grow rice, which of course I naturally didn't know the first thing about, but also how to do complicated molecular techniques that she herself had optimized so that they worked in this incredibly resource-limited environment. And Jeanette was phenomenal at this. She had what scientists call good hands. Her experiments worked, and that's rare in science. And she was respected within this institution. She was earning enough money to put her daughter through school and herself through night school to finally finish high school. And this lab produced what are now 18 varieties of rice being grown currently in 23 countries across Africa. And so this was an incredible example of one person's tremendous opportunity to transform the life of herself and of her family. But to me, of course, and I'm biased, it's also a story about the potential of science to transform the lives of millions of people. Because imagine, imagine what we could do with thousands of labs like this across the world. Imagine institutions that could give the opportunity of an education to tens of thousands of Jeannettes and give them the tools and the training to solve the world's most important problems. That is the opportunity that I'm interested in making real. And I ask myself the question every day, how to make that opportunity a reality? And I am probably not the most likely person in the world to try to address that problem. Because <laughs> you want to know how to dissect fruit fly larvae, I am your gal. <laughs> you want to look at fluorescently labeled DNA under a microscope, I have got you. But I do not have a background in international development. I don't have any formal training in economics or business. Why do I think that I am going to solve this complicated problem? Because I'm my grandmother's descendant. And she, she taught me nothing else by walking through the door of that Chinese restaurant. And she said, you do not let a lack of the obvious qualification keep you from getting through the door. <laughs> now, I had and was born into and pursued opportunities to get an incredibly special and unique kind of education. And so if I'm going to try to produce this kind of opportunity, I have to use what I've had. And what I know is the scientific method. And I think it's an incredible kind of training in how to identify and solve problems. And so that's what I do. Problem. Scientific lab equipment is unbelievably expensive, and it is out of the price range of institutions across the world. Labs stand empty. Students don't get a hands-on education. Their professors do not stay current with techniques, and incredibly important problems across the world remain unsolved. Hypothesis. <laughs> what if we turn the surplus of equipment at well-resourced companies and institutions here into a means of making the tools of science affordable and available to institutions around the world? If they get the right tools, they can do the experiments to write the papers, to get the funding, to buy the tools, and so on. Results. So far, distributed over $1 million worth of lab equipment to institutions in 16 countries on three continents. Students, thousands of them, 
who previously were learning by looking at a picture of a piece of equipment on a chalkboard, now have it in their hands in their very school. Of the scientists that we've worked with just in Latin America, they've, dumped, they've increased their research funding by 216% on average. They produced five dozen publications, a patent, and a diagnostic test for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Science works, people. <laughs> and it also teaches us something else. Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. Because you don't just have opportunities, you make opportunities. And if you know what it is, if you spend the time to know what your goals are, where it is that you want to go, and what you want to get done, then you are much more likely to recognize a potential opportunity when it happens to come your way. I'll give you another example. Sometimes lab equipment's not the solution. Depending on where you are, there are a lot of other problems that get in the way of being able to use it. There's the human component that we have to address. And I knew that this was something that I wanted to do, but I wasn't really sure how I was going to make it happen. But I wrote it down. I had a three-year plan for making this happen, and I put it on paper. And one month later, a major pharmaceutical research company expressed interest in doing some kind of exchange program. And so now I was, I, not three months earlier, have even recognized this as an opportunity. But now I could see it as an opportunity to do exactly what was needed, which was to formulate another hypothesis. What if we identify potential leaders on their campuses and train them in world-class laboratories, have them meet and connect with their colleagues here to share ideas and plan new projects so that they can go back to their home campuses and mentor their students better, design better, and conduct better projects and become leaders in a nucleus of change on their campus to change the entire culture of science where they live. And that's exactly what we've started to do. And some preliminary data from this experiment. This is Evans Changamu. And since he's returned to his home campus in Kenya, he is working with scientists that he met here to design the, a brand new field of research on his campus in computational chemistry. And he's working with scientists that he met here to, to design the curriculum for the first ever class in nanochemistry to be taught in Kenya. Now, this is not magic, of course. I had opportunities by dint of birth. I pursued opportunities that I realized for an education, for the opportunity to turn that education into a means to solve a problem that I care deeply about. And this is not magical. This is something that every single one of us can do. Because all of us have been born into opportunity. And let's be honest, all of us in this room have moved beyond subsistence. And so I think we actually have the opportunity and also the responsibility to do more than just survive from day to day. Every single one of us is the beneficiary of someone who came before us who expanded the possibilities for us. And I think every single one of us has the opportunity to expand the range of the possible for somebody else. So I ask you today, what will you do with your opportunity?